Okay, so we talked about a little bit about cancer and statistics, and we've talked about some of the basic mutations that happen, things like accelerator genes, break genes and repair genes, which technically are called proto-oncogens, tumor suppressor genes and repair enzymes. So we've talked about those. Now what I want you to do is I actually want you to watch a video, and you probably already saw the link to the video, and it's only four minutes, so it's not very long, but it's actually talking about a specific type of cancer, and it's one of the most common cancers out there. So it's important to watch the video, and as you're watching the video, if you haven't already watched it, just write these down. It's not super in, in detail, but first I want you to answer what is NSCLC. Second, what are the subtypes that they list right in the first basically 15 seconds? And then does the progression of the video actually make sense to you? So when we're putting these videos together, I'm not putting it together to just list off tons of diseases. What I'm trying to do is help you understand the pathophysiology of the progress. So after watching the last video, does watching this little video on NSCLC, does it make sense? Do the pieces come together right? Does it make sense in the way it progresses, that it's multiple mutations? Does, does what I told you about how it's, it reaches out to grab blood vessels make sense? And if there wasn't something that you understood, jot it down here. So I'm game to listen. All right, so just to review mutation, normal genes, we talked about this in genetics, you can have point mutations and chromosome instability. Point mutations are the base pairs that are misaligned, so it's one single set of letters that's changed. And a lot of times you get that, but it's an accumulation of different base pairs that are happening. So one base pair affects one gene, another base pair affects another, another base pair until finally you have a cancer. Another problem that can happen is chromosome instability, and, and we talked about this when we talked about things like Robertsonian translocation, where you take a piece of one chromosome and it gets broken off and gets glued onto another one. So it's just rearranging it. We talked about things like inversions, where you take a piece of chromosome, break it off, and the repair enzymes go, ooh, where does this go? And they flip it and glue it in backwards. So a couple of the ones we'll talk about are chromosome amplification, uh, chromosome loss, and, and loss of heterozygosity. And we'll even talk about things called caretaker genes too. So the first one, chromosome amplification, it tells you exactly what it is. A piece of a chromosome gets broken off, it gets flipped around and put in the wrong place, and it's actually amplified. So like for instance, on this last slide, I'll go back to it real quick. If I broke off a piece of this chromosome, and accidentally glued it on right here. Every time that this gene on this broken piece of chromosome, well, actually the solid piece of chromosome, when it gets turned on, it turns on the broken piece too. So normally I'd activate this chromosome, but when I'm activating this one now, I accidentally make this. Right? You can have where this piece of chromosome is broken off and glued on here. And if that happens every time I turn on one piece of this gene, I get two of it, and it's amplified. So when you look at pictures like this, um, like neuro or neuroblastoma, this is an example of a neuron. And here you can see, where did my little mouse go? There it is. You can see the little pieces of the proteins that are expressed. So we, we put linkers on here, basically fluorescent um, markers that glow when that protein is expressed. And we have this gene express it. And you can see a normal protein will be expressed twice in this situation. But when you get some of those chromosome amplifications and you try and express it just one time, what you see is you can see hundreds of pieces of this expressed. Right? And neuroblastoma is actually a solid tumor of childhood, and it, and it arises outside the brain. We'll talk about it a little bit more on the next slide, but um, it's a really common disorder. And here it is. So about 50% of the tumors are very aggressive. And you can see that the tumors aren't actually in the brain, but you can see how the tumors are growing around the orbits. You can see them growing down here off the side of the spinal column. You can see them all over the place. About 50% occur in children that are under two. So it's a common childhood disorder. Right? And what you have to worry about the most is since it's extra cranial or outside the brain is that this thing metastasizes easily and goes to all parts of the body. So a lot of times what you'll see is it goes straight down to the spinal cord and it can grow on the spinal cord and pinch it off. You'll see it grows on the liver commonly. It causes a lot of grosser tumors on the liver. It can go to the pancreas, it can go to bone, it can go to kidney, it can go all over the place and increase it. But these things metastasize all over the place. They're a huge threat and they're very dangerous. Next is chromosome instability. So loss of heterozygosity means that you're not homozygous now. It means that you're originally heterozygous. So remember, when you're looking at a chromosome, you may have, well, here's your gene. Same gene on both sides. If you're heterozygous, it means it's two different alleles, right? Well, if you're missing one gene and you have one allele here, this is considered heterozygous too. So in this situation, you're heterozygous, but what happens if you're living your life, you smoke too many cigarettes, and suddenly you lose that chromosome or that part of that chromosome? Well, now you don't have that gene at all. 
not only do you not have a gene here, but you don't even have a, a bad flawed one over here. You have no gene, period. They call this the two-hit hypothesis. So the first hit can come during heredity. heredity. You can be born with a flawed gene. And then the second hit comes with mutation. Or you could be, you know, have a mutated structure here any time in your life, and then later you knock out the second one, accumulation mutations, which is what we usually refer to as a cancer, right? So in this situation, you could also have where you have one good gene, and this one by epigenetics or gene silencing or whatever is not working, right? So it's not working. It's muted. This could be a healthy one. This could be a healthy one. But now suddenly what happened is that you lose this one healthy one, but because of methylation or epigenetics, this one's never expressed. So it looks exactly the same as this. You didn't lose this gene, but you can't express it. Remember, it's tied up in the cord, like I was using with that epigenetics example earlier. Right? So what they call the two-hit hypothesis is first, your germline deletes it, so you get a bad one from mom or dad, and the second one is because of something that happens in you, somatic mitotic recombination, a flaw or mutation knocks out your other good one. One situation you'll probably see this in is retinoblastoma. Retinoblastoma is actually a common childhood cancer. And about 95% of, of children under five years of age, this looks weird, 95% of the retinoblastoma cases are children under five years of age. Um, as, as I was saying, I said it wrong. But uh, it can be hereditary. So remember, mom or dad can pass down, or it can be spontaneous. So I'll go back to that other slide real quick. So what if mom and dad gave you good genes, but epigenetics shut one off, and then suddenly a mutation shut the other one off? had nothing to do with passing down from mom and dad. This was all spontaneous. It was all in you, in your somatic genes. Right? And then this is the most predominant childhood cancer. So you see it a lot. And you can see the progression. <clears throat> like here's sporadic. Neither mom nor dad had it, but the child has it because the child had sporadic changes and knocked out the gene. Here you can see that one of the parents had it, Who? which parent has it if it's a round circle? Mom. Yep. So females round, squares, dad. So mom had it, mom passed it down to child, and so the child had one gene, child could also have a knockout so that the one good gene dad gave was bad too. So here you can see sporadic where it's mutations, where hereditary means that at least one of the parents passed it down. Heck, dad could could have passed down a good gene too, but because they have the retinoblastoma gene, they do get retinoblastoma. Right? And then, uh, here's an example of how it grows. So here's an eyeball. Here you can see the tumor growing right behind the retina. So there's the retina pressed very forward, and then there's your lens. You can see here it's pushing forward, and what happens if you shine a light in their eye, you can see that silver glimmer. That's actually a light bouncing off the tumor. It's not the blood vessels. Normally when you see red eye, you see the, red, the blood vessels in the choroid layer. But this tumor here is actually giving a reflective shiny surface and it bounces light back so you can actually see it. And then here you have retinoblastomas growing down here. So a tumor caused by retinoblastoma growing and pinching on the spinal cord. All right, next gene silencing, and this goes back to epigenetics. And you're already familiar with this, but with gene silencing, you could have whole areas of a chromosome that don't work. You get the good genes, but you lose it. And commonly, what'll happen is caretaker genes are affected. So if you lose a caretaker gene, these are the repair genes. They fix chromosomes. If you don't have them, you can't fix the chromosome. So you break a piece of chromosome, poof, it's gone. Yeah, it just doesn't fix. And of course, if you have bad caretaker genes, then the mutations are going to amplify really, really, really quickly. So these are really dangerous changes to lose a caretaker. Right. Let's talk slightly about childhood cancers. So Childhood, we're going to go a little bit more specific into things like incidence. But the incidence, it's the second leading cause of death in children. Um, it's extremely high, and a lot of these are actually hereditary, hereditary diseases. Right? So, oh, and, uh, sorry, I forgot. Second leading cause of death in children from zero to one years of age. Um, SIDS is actually one of the primary killers of children. From one to four, it's accidents, and then from five to 14, it's accidents again. And you can actually see that, that cancer starts rising the list the older the kids get. The same with us. The older we get, the more cancers. Right? And then uh, 9,500 children up to the age of 15 are diagnosed with cancers every year, and one in 900 people between the age of 15 and 45 will actually be a survivor of childhood cancers. Right, so childhood cancers, most of them, I'm saying most, arise from the mesodermal germ layer. So remember you have the endoderm, the ectoderm, and the mesoderm. And if you remember the different layers, the ectoderm is like the skin and nervous tissue, the mesoderm is the muscles, the endoderm, is everything in 
like that's inside the body but has exposure to the outside, like respiratory tract, the GI tract, um, things like that. So mesoderms, everything between the skin basically and whatever tube structure has exposure to the outside. So you see things like connective tissue, bone, cartilage, muscle disorders, yeah. and lymphatics. So we'll talk about leukemias. In fact, childhood cancers here, you can see them rated. So the most common is leukemia, second most common are brain tumors. All right, and then here's a slide that actually illustrates more. So common childhood cancers, leukemias, sarcomas, which are re related to connective tissue, like muscle, bone cancers, and then embryonic tumors, which embryonic tumors stem, come from stem cells. And embryonic tumors are usually diagnosed early in life because they're happening in, in utero is when they're developing. And then leukemia, when you look at the childhood cancers, about one third of all childhood cancers are a form of leukemia. And it's the most common malignancy in children. Do you get benign leukemias? No. If you have a leukemia, it's always considered a malignant cancer. Right? And we talked about this before with Down syndrome. So children with Down syndrome have a higher risk, about 10 to 20 times higher, that they'll have leukemia. Do you remember the other disorder that Down syndrome children get that, that puts a risk on their life? So of course they have low IQ and different physical features, but what internal physical feature? Heart problems. So kind of linking that back to the genetic section again. And then I was talking about before um, children that are in their 15, 15 to 39 years of age, survivors, you can see most of the survivors are still going to be leukemia survivors. But you can see Hodgkin's and, and other types of tumors like neuroblastoma that we talked about just a little bit ago. So most of these people that lived through childhood cancers, you can see the common things that they had. Right. So next, sarcomas, and remember sarcomas are from connective tissue. So common, car common sarcomas are like bone tumors, like osteosarcoma or Ewing sarcoma. Ewing sarcomas, what they get are, are malignant small round, what they call blue cell tumors. It's kind of a rare disease, and it's found in bone or soft tissues, and it's usually like the pelvis or the femur or the humerus. So I'm not going to expect you to know a lot of details, but in general, it's a sarcoma. It's a bone tumor, right? They call them um, blue cell tumors because when you put them under a microscope slide, they stain really blue very well. With leukemias, I forgot to mention this picture, though. Here you can see no, normal blood, lots and lots of red blood cells, very few white blood cells. With leukemia, you can see lots and lots of the white blood cells all over the place. And we'll talk about leukemia when we get to blood again, like uh, the blood cardiovascular systems. And then other common cancers already talked about neuroblastoma. A, Wil a Wilms tumor is an, a nephroblastoma. So what's nephro implying? It's a kidney. And then retinoblastoma we already talked about. And rhabdomyosarcoma, this, like I said, we want to work on the, the words. Sarcoma is referring to a what? Is it benign or malignant? It's malignant. And it's also referring to, is it epithelium or connective? It's connective tissue. In fact, it tells you what kind of connective tissue is talking. Myo is the muscle. So rhabdomyosarcomas are actually a type of soft tissue cancer that's found in children. And usually what they show as is a lump. So you can see this rhabdomyosarcoma in this little kid here. And it typically develops in skeletal muscle, so it can appear anywhere in the body. About 30 to 40% of these little um, lumps or tumors are actually going to show in the head and the neck region. Um, some like 20-25% are going to show up in reproductive organs or the urinary tract, but they show up right underneath the skin or under the epithelial tissue. Right. So the etiology, it can be ecogenetic, so it can be genetic or environment, and ecogenetics is actually talking about how it's both, so how the environment affects genetic factors. So you may get it passed down from your parents, but maybe something that happened in utero that changes it. So things like chromosome abnormalities, it can be the oncogen or tumor suppressor genes that, that flip off or on. Um, we talked about these different situ situations in the genetic section, like aneuploidy and amplifications and deletions. And then Fanconi syndrome. Fanconi's is actually, um, it's a really rare disease, about one in 350,000. So, and it's more prominent in the Ashkenazi Jew population. So it's not a real, not something you see a ton of, right? But usually it just results in congenital defects like short stature, uh, skin issues, their arms, head, kidney, ears, usually have um, shrunken features. And median age is, is actually about 30 years of age, so it's something that they don't you know, live a long time with. And then Bloom syndrome is another one that's carried down Ashkenazi populations. But it's similar symptoms, short stature, narrow face, 
um, they actually get kind of a butterfly facial rash. So it kind of looks like, like um, a lupus, erythematosus. And then, of course, high recurrence risk. When we talked about this before, when you're talking about something that goes in a small population, like an ethnic population, the high recurrence risk is because they carry the gene. Like I said, with Bloom syndrome, about one in every 100 Ashkenazi Jew descendants will have it. So if two of them uh, meet up and reproduce, then the risk is a lot higher that way. And that term, remember, was called consanguinity, so close relatives. And then etiology, environmental factors, so prenatal exposure, what they're exposed to. I use the word teratogens in the genetic section. But are they getting the proper nutrients? Are they getting the proper vitamins, like B vitamins? Folic acid is really important for neural development. Um, child exposure while they're you know, in utero, exposure to alcohol, secondhand smoke, even after they're born. So after they're born, being exposed to all of those things. And then the prognosis of childhood cancer, the five-year survival rates, roughly 80% across the board. So kids are way better responders. They're not done with their plasticity and they're growing. So if they have something that's broken or removed, they actually have a greater chance of, of repair and moving on to be an adult. So they're able to tolerate treatments a lot better because their bodies are more resilient to change. And then they're more likely to be enrolled in clinical trials too. So if there's a new treatment, they're more likely to get involved in it because you know, they have a long future ahead of them. And then the residual and long-term effects of the treatment are usually a little bit lower with the kids because their bodies are more resist resilient. And this last one, psychological sequelae, I'm actually going to have you do a little homework assignment on that one and look it up. So I've, I've given you this. There are two parts of this homework assignment, and they're, they're really brief. In fact, when you look at this first one, it just shows you like eight or nine disorders, and you're just going to pick the ones. But so we want to know how has research made a difference in childhood cancers. So I want you to actually web search whatever web format you have. St. Jude Research Statistics Cancer Survival Rates, those exact words. And you'll pull up a page at St. Jude's website that, that shows a list of the changes from 1962 until today. What has happened to the five-year survival rate in cancers in children? So I want you to look through and I want you to determine which two have made the most progress. So if you see one that goes from like 40% to 80%, I mean, that's a good change. So the survival rates jumped up significantly, but if you see one that's gone from like 4% to 95, you know, there's a, what, 91% change. There's a huge change there. Write it down, and the second thing I want you to do is I want you to figure out what the embryonic tissue they originated from. So does it match up with what we looked at before when we talked about which layer is primarily contributing to childhood cancers? And then the second part of it, does age make a difference in the psychological effects of leukemia? So I want you to search social and emotional effects leukemia and then actually at about kids health. So you can put that all in the search bar and it should pull up one website, the very first website, and when you click on it, it actually has a, you know, a short page that talks about what the psychological effects of childhood cancers are on um, younger children, adolescents, and transitioning adolescents. So I just want you to write down what are some of the psychological things that happen to young children and then what are some of the psychological effects on older children? Like, how do they handle change? How do they handle the emotional you know, issues revolving around cancer? And that's it. Stop here, and we'll see you in the next video.